couple of short talks. And the next speaker is Lucy Bation, and she's from Leicester. Uh, and she'll be talking about cognitive uh, training uh, using mixed methods uh, to prevent dementia and dependency. Um, let me see if we can share your... Um, Felicity's email. The Felicity did... Um, I've emailed it to you, yeah. Um, so we'll just quickly... There we go. Oh, yes. Yeah. See, here we're working very closely together, Lucy and I. Team effort. Team effort. Okay. Um, share screen. Let me. It's this one, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Okie dokie. Lucy, thank you. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Lucy, um, as you've introduced me. Um, the last talk was quite a hard act to follow. I really enjoyed it, um, but I'm going to change tack slightly and talk a bit about some of the work for my PhD um, that I've been doing on a Dunhill Clinical Research Fellow. Um, this is just one part of it, but this is the mixed method analysis of, a, of the cognition and flow study that I ran. Um, so as you're all aware, there's a, we've got an aging population um, and in clinic at the moment with people living with dementia, we have very little to offer them in terms of good treatments or indeed preventative strategies for, for older people that are worried about developing dementia or at risk of. Um, cognitive training is one of these um, treatments that there's been a lot of interest around recently, um, possibly because it's maybe a bit cheaper than developing a um, pharmacological sort of drug target um, and possibly also that there's fewer side effects, but I'll come on to some of the, the issues around that um, in this talk. Um, while there's been quite a lot of studies looking at cognitive training, there's fewer that have looked at brain imaging, so the mechanisms by which cognitive training might be beneficial or sort of repetitive brain kind of stimulation or training. Um, and in particular, there aren't many that focus on blood flow or vascular mechanisms associated with dementia. Um, and that's something that's become of increasing interest in recent years, um, both in Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. There's signs that sort of reduced blood flow could be quite important. So the aim of this study was really to try and address that evidence gap and look at the effects that cognitive training has on vascular physiology in the brain. So this was a mixed methods study. Um, it had an overarching quantitative design, which was a feasibility randomized control trial. Um, so participants came from an initial assessment, um, underwent either a cognitive training invest, uh, intervention or were randomized to um, a sort of waiting list control. That was for 12 weeks and then they returned for a follow-up assessment. Um, participants who completed the training were then invited to do an interview study. So we did semi-structured interviews um, and um, ultimately we then integrated the data using joint displays to try and profile participants based on their quantitative and qualitative outcomes. So we recruited 20 healthy older adults, um, 20 people, 24 people living with Alzheimer's disease and 12 um, people with mild cognitive impairment. Um, and as I said, we randomised them to one of the two conditions. The training programme was provided by Lumosity and it was um, targeting five key cognitive domains, which we mirrored in the vascular sort of blood flow assessment, uh, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, this study looks at half of these participants because we only investigate, we only interviewed the people that completed the training. Um, so the outcomes for the study we looked at, we looked at cognition, so we used the Adam Brooks cognitive examination, we looked at mood using the geriatric depression scale, quality of life using the DEMQOL Dem and the function using the Lawton IADL. Um, we also conducted a brain blood flow assessment on all the participants, so you can see a picture of me sporting our transcranial Doppler system, which is um, an ultrasound based way of measuring brain blood flow. It's quite nice for people living with dementia because you don't have to put them through a scanner. You can interact with them the whole time. Um, there's no radiation involved. And also you can do tasks with people. So this is a, a picture of me kind of doing a, a cognitive kind of test from, um, from the Adam Brooks with um, one of my colleagues. 
Um, and we used that, we looked at five different cognitive tests to try and stimulate blood flow. Um, and what you can see in the bottom hand of the screen is a raw kind of trace file of a, of a blood flow um, that we would see on an ultrasound scan. Um, what we then did was we classified people into two groups. So we looked at people who were either low adherers to cognitive training and those that were high adherers. And we, we used a cut off of 20 hours of training for that. Um, and we also classified people in their pattern of blood flow response. So people that increased their blood flow responses after training, people where they stayed the same and people where they decreased. And then we used joint displays to kind of integrate the, the data from the blood flow information, but also from the interview information. So the aims of this analysis were to look at how the qualitative results from the interview study explain kind of dropouts and um, non-adherence to, to the training programme and whether the baseline character characteristics of the people um, who dropped out, whether that can also help predict, predict that. Um, we then looked at the quantitative and qualitative profiles, so looked at the outcome measures to see are there some patients or some participants that benefit more than other people? Um, and what recommendations can we maybe draw from um, what we learned from this study? So um, we had five participants who were classified as low adherence on the training to so less than 20 hours. Um, and they were median training was around 17 hours compared to nearly 40 hours in the high adherence. So there was quite a, a reasonable difference. And three participants with Alzheimer's disease dropped out from the training quite early on. Um, the high adherers were by and large were healthy participants, mild cognitive impairment, and then five with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in terms of the low adherers, the majority, as expected, were, were Alzheimer's disease participants, one with MCI. And there's one healthy participant that was a bit of an anom anomaly who had, had good adherence, but had very few benefits, both quantitatively and qualitatively. So we kind of analysed them with this group because they, their profile sat better with this group. So in the low adherence group, most of the, the participants were male. Um, they tended to be older, um, but they had reasonable years of education. Um, the, ma the majority were on anti-dementia drugs, but interestingly, a lot were, had quite mild Alzheimer's disease. So the, the average ACE 3 score was 80, which isn't, isn't too bad, actually. Um, there did tend to be more barriers amongst the low adherers, as one would expect, um, and these tended to be less modifiable. So there were things that the patients couldn't really change the severity of their dementia, perhaps they had apathy, they lacked insight into their dementia, and they were often quite reliant on the carers for support through the program as well. Whereas the high adherers tended to have fewer barriers and they were more modifiable, so things that they could do something about, like minimising um, noise and distractions, finding a suitable environment for the training, um, those kind of things. Um, as I said, there was greater need for carer support amongst the um, low adherence group, which then resulted in some care of friction and strain, which, which could be a problem. Um, and those participants tend to be less resilient to problems or issues. So when things did arise, they didn't have the coping skills or the mechanisms perhaps to deal with them um, or find strategies to try and improve things or sort them out. So these are just some example quotes from participants in my study. So for example, a healthy participant said, even though they were frustrating, I enjoyed doing them because I wanted to do them better or get a better score because I knew I could do them. So that participant had quite high self-efficacy um, throughout the training, which helped motivate them to, to continue to do it. Similarly, um, a participant with mild cognitive impairment um, said, just because I don't like a game doesn't mean to say that you should stop doing it because um, I've got to keep getting used to it, haven't I? Um, respond to the challenge. So they sort of saw that there was a challenge that um, they wanted to meet. Um, and they also had obviously quite high motivation to be able to get through the problems that they were having. This was quite in contrast to my participants with Alzheimer's disease um, at the bottom where, for example, a carer saying that he got irritated with me trying to get him to do them. So that's that carer friction coming out where they were trying to provide support, but finding it quite challenging. Um, and another carer of a participant with Alzheimer's disease saying um, that they used to love doing crosswords and Sudoku, um, but now they have no interest in that. So that's that apathy sort of lack of motivation coming through that, that could be quite difficult for participants. Um, so just to show you a bit of um, a snap, sort of snapshot of data from the joint displays in the participants who had increased blood flow responses uh, tended to be participants with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. Um, and they mostly had stable or improved cognition, quality of life and mood. But there was a bit of a, a mixed bag of both positive and negative qualitative experiences. Um, and three of these participants were actually low adherers to the training. Um, and this is just an example of a participant that had an increase in blood flow, um, had a bit of mixed responses on some of the other qualitative outcomes. 
um, but were actually quite pleased and happy with how they did on the training. They had more good days than bad. They felt challenged. But at the same time, they could be frustrated and depressed um, with difficult exercises. So there was quite a lot of mixed um, um, sort of emotions coming out of the, um, the qualitative interviews. In terms of the neutral, so these are participants that didn't have an increase or a decrease in their blood flow after training. Um, most were healthy, um, had very few quantitative benefits um, that we could measure. Um, but most of the qualitative experiences were quite positive. So things that were coming out there were that they thought it was good to have an active mind to sort of keep stimulated. They were taught like routines and strategies that they could use. Um, and they found that they learned things and they enjoyed it as well. And most of them didn't um, identify any self-reported improvements either, which did align with the, what we saw quantitatively on the sort of the questionnaires that we did with them. Um, and in terms of the reduced blood flow response group, interestingly, again, this was mostly healthy and mild quantum impairment um, participants uh, with some quantitative benefits and generally sort of quite po positive qualitative benefits. Um, interestingly, frustration was a, a theme that we saw across all of the groups, um, and that did tend to be around the use of technology um, and particularly if there were software problems or things weren't quite, quite going right with the programme that particularly they felt were out of their control. So what we we set out to look for a profile of a participant to say, to say that they, they might be that's who we might target training towards and actually what we found was there was no particular profile that predicted somebody who would get more benefits from the training um, and actually those with low adherence so people living without Alzheimer's disease could have both quantitative and qualitative benefits um, and there was quite for a number of participants those positive experiences outweighed the negative experiences so really what I think we learned from this was that a tailored approach is, is needed to training and that just because you're a low adherer doesn't necessarily mean that you perhaps shouldn't be engaging with these activities because there could still be benefits for them. So these were some of the recommendations that we kind of came up with as a result of the study. So perhaps it might be if you identified a, a participant or a patient for cognitive intervention, there could be a series of um, key risk factors for not engaging well with the program. And these were the ones that we picked out from um, our kind of interview study and our mixed method analysis. And this could then lead on to um, classifying people who had few or few barriers and high barriers. Importantly, amongst the few barrier group, um, so people who are more likely to engage with training, you still need, there is important things that you need to consider. So um, they're likely to cope with higher difficulty levels and they're likely to need more rapid progression of the training. And if they don't have that, they're probably going to get demotivated if the progression is too slow. And both groups need quite significant personalised feedback. That was something that was really important from um, all of the participants in the study um, on how they were doing and how their brain was, was responding, not just um, how they were doing generically. Um, for the significant barriers group, we sort of suggested that maybe treating coexisting problems such as anxiety and depression might be important. Um, definitely considering early cessation for the three participants that I had that struggled, we just stopped the training straight away because um, they were having quite significant side effects from it. Um, then it's probably going to need more support, particularly for carers, where there's a lot of carer reliance, um, because that can cause a lot of extra strain and friction. Um, and it's important to have a supportive and motivation environment for participants. And interestingly, quite a lot of this sort of feeds into this technology aspect we're talking about. Quite a few participants said they would like to start with paper and pen exercises. Perhaps that's because that's what they're more used to and then graduate that into a technological um, program um, rather than going because they found that trying to learn the computer as well as learning a program was too much it sort of overwhelms them all at once. So perhaps learning the exercises and then transferring it to a computer might be easier for them. Um, but those were some of the things that, we, that came out of that. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I had a lot of support to do this study from all my supervisors, from the Alzheimer's Society, the Dunhill Trust and my patient and public involvement group. Um, I think most of the papers are out now or in preprint, so you can access those online. Um, I'm also happy to answer if you want to get in touch with me at any point um, to talk about maybe taking this to the next sort of stage. I'd be interested to hear from people. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask people if they have questions. That was really good. Lots of food for thought. Um, any any questions from the audience from from here? You you guys in 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 life? Yes, Tracy. It's interesting that the care is the one for this friction. There, that's mm. exactly what you said. That's the full work because it has to be a holistic approach for yeah. everybody. Yeah, I guess there's correlation there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Definitely.
Yeah, I thought um, what was really interesting was to sort of try to identify and that, that, that very much links into how we set up the talks where we're looking now at level of ability and mm. digital literacy. And then our next talk will be on that sensory mm. deficit, like the visual deficits, yeah. because it's very hard. What are you going to do? And the literacy mm. and, 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 and previous experience. And also, as you mentioned, those those challenging behaviors, the depression, mm -hmm. the apathy and mm -hmm. how to overcome that. Yeah. Have you got any ideas on on what you found when you were doing this program? What what came out? Yeah, so I, I actually ended up doing some home visits to go and set up the technology in well, set the mm -hmm. training up in mm -hmm. their home on their computer because it. <laughs> The, being able to run it varied by operating system um, how and most of the computers were ancient um, luckily the program could run on a very old system right. but that's a challenge so if if it only runs on modern computers yes. or modern systems that's quite difficult mm. most patients preferred to use their own computer so I did have laptops available to use in the study and most preferred it to be set up on their home computer because that's what they were familiar with mm -hmm. and again I think with when you're living with dementia any Thing extra that you have to add on to something is, is another thing so that's what they were saying to me it's the, the additive effect of learning technology plus the program that's right um, on top so then if you had a new technology that they weren't used to plus the program it was going to be it was quite overwhelming for them um, mm -hmm. the carers were really good um, as part of the study and they but it, for some of them it was quite a significant amount of effort particularly mm -hmm. where there was as I say the apathy um or getting quite frustrated and it often got mm -hmm. taken out on the carer so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i had to be very mindful of that through the study when i was supporting them to mm -hmm. make sure um I and mean, i think that's going to be a challenge for, for patients where you have those mm -hmm. those kind of issues what about the program itself this luminosity it, it, yeah. it, it, is it <laughs> what i got back from the quality it was like well it's really boring but we gotta do it is there any way that you could come up with something more fun yeah. Um, so well, what was yeah, it the program it was mixed so most of the most of the people actually quite enjoyed it they were they were sort of okay. like brain game exercises mm -hmm. i think the 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 main thing was they were getting quite frustrated there was a lot of bugs in the program oh. so they were getting frustrated with the, the bug issue um mm -hmm. so on the whole they liked it. i mean the it's not the most flexible so i was able to select from a range of exercises which is what i did and i selected ones to target certain brain areas so that i could map okay. that to the blood flow responses mm -hmm. um but um, I think that what, what was really coming out of it was that participants it would give them this score, which was entirely, seemed to be entirely random. It was a huge number. It seemed to be completely not relative to anything. It was irrelevant to them. And they just said, I want to know how my, is my brain yeah. improving? What's, you know, what's going yeah. on? And I think there are some training programs that are better at that. So I think maybe Brain HQ gives you like brain health scores things like that and I think that that participants really like that but as, if it's too generic and it's just a random number they just they lose interest absolutely it. as yeah. you would uh, but I think uh, making it coming back to what Alison said about the kids mm -hmm. using figurative material cartoons yeah. you know yeah. um making it not 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 being very careful not to make it infantile yeah but um coming up with something that's easy to yeah. understand you improve yeah you know uh 30 percent a lot of people will understand the bar that goes yeah. up you know making something a little bit more uh uh, personal a uh, and b understandable a few mm -hmm. participants mm -hmm. said that they at first thought they felt a bit patronized by the program uh, because they said it did look a bit childish a bit game like mm -hmm. um and then but then a few said that then as they progressed through it they realized actually it wasn't and it was okay. quite hard <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that was more so amongst the healthy older adults that felt more patronized i'd say mm. than the people i think the people with dementia were just too busy trying to understand it all whereas mm. um the healthy participants found it um initially and then they said mm -hmm. once they worked through it and they got to the higher levels and i think that's the thing about it progressing fast enough mm -hmm. for them yeah yeah i remember years ago there was a an online incredibly successful word uh, worldwide program uh, for kids to do mathematics online and you progressed levels and it was very good it, it was an online a web-based game and you could play against other children and you saw how well you did in the ranking mm -hmm. um but it was a lot of fun but this is something that came out of our exercise program so remember years ago we had um about physical activity for people with dementia and the main thing that came out was it has to be fun mm -hmm. and you gotta have a sense of progress yeah um because if you don't and you yeah. don't have that self-efficacy you mentioned yeah 
then it doesn't work. Yeah. Great, great talk, Lucy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, again, if you have questions, um, comments, put them on your form. We'll have a lot of time to talk about uh, issues during the sandpit. Uh, keep your questions there or put them in the uh, chat. And then Lucy can have a look at the chat and see if she wants to uh, wants to well if you, if 